And all right, John chapter 4 this morning. John chapter 4. Jesus has just witnessed to the Samaritan woman. Uh, and the Jews, they just didn't get that. You know, they, for the longest time, and they knew they were God's chosen people, no doubt about it. Um, but as Jesus shows up on the scene and presents himself as Messiah, they will later on, they will ultimately reject him. And then Jesus will prove himself that he is what it says in verse 42, the last phrase, the Christ, the Savior of the world. He's the Savior of the world. Not was, he was not just for the Jewish people. It was to the Jew first and then also to the Gentiles, Paul would write in Romans. And they would have a hard time with that. But Gospel of John, witness is a big word in, in this. I mean, if we, you've paid attention and you have in the first three and a half chapters that we've studied, John the Baptist was a witness to him that this is the Son of God. And then the five disciples that were one, one they were telling people already about this is the Christ. And then when Jesus, uh, Nicodemus would come to Jesus in, in John chapter 3, then Jesus was witnessing to who he was. And then when he came to the Samaritan woman, the Samaritan woman just absolutely, there's no doubt, I think, that this woman got saved right here and would run back and be a witness to the whole town of Samaria. And that's what we're commanded to do. It's not, we can look around the world and say that there's a need. I think God lays it on individual hearts where they go and what they do or what I do, where I go. Um, we talk about that, but actually the need's everywhere. It's not just one place above another. People need to be saved everywhere. And we don't necessarily go because there's a need. We go because he tells us to. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, and then in Acts 1.8, you know that verse, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea, and in Samaria. You know, Jesus was right here with this Samaritan woman, and they threw in Samaritan, Samaria. Remember, Samaria, the Samaritans were enemies with the Jews. And we went through that history last week. And so here in our orders to go into all the world, Samaria is on there, and then unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so we're commanded. We're we're supposed to be witnesses. We're supposed to be telling people about Christ. And we're going to take this woman as an example of how Christ had such an impact on her life that she just went to her hometown, just back to town and telling everybody about Christ. And isn't that the way it is when people first get saved? I mean, they just, they get, they just tell people. They start telling everybody about Christ. It concerns me a little bit when people get saved and, and they don't tell anybody. You know, you, you meet one of their friends and you go, hey, did, did they tell you they got saved? And they go, oh, no, they didn't tell me. Um, and they might be bashful, they might be shy, whatever. But uh, we look at this story of the Samaritan woman. We see a lot of good things about us being witnesses. And it's just wherever we are. It's just wherever we are. At the grocery store, neighborhood, Las Vegas, Wherever it is, Philippines, Greece, it doesn't matter. We just tell people who Jesus is. And that's what we're commanded to do. And as a church, we're doing it here, you know, putting out those uh, flyers into every home, the gospel in every home. Uh, we'll see what God does with that. I'm excited to see what God would do with that. But let's get into the story. We'll pick it up where we left off last week. Uh, when Jesus, when the woman said in verse 25, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And then his disciples show up and they marvel. It says, and, he, and upon this came his disciples and they marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? I mean, they probably were speechless when they turned the corner or topped the hill, wherever it was, that when they first spotted Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman. But they were at least respectful enough not to go up and go, what are you doing here, woman? What are you seeking? And, or they wouldn't look, go to Jesus and go, Jesus, why are you talking with this woman? You know, don't you know she's a Samaritan? And then the woman, verse um, 
28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the man, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. I want to say first thing in these, as we look at these verses that witnessing is evidence of new birth. Witnesses, witnessing is evidence of new birth. This woman, she went into this town. She, when, when, when Christ said, I'm he, she had already been convicted of her sin. She had already been exposed. Now she goes into the city and she doesn't even care about her reputation anymore. She just goes and... Gather, people gather around and she's saying, there's this man out here that's told me everything about me. Now, he didn't. But now, if somebody walked up to you and told you two or three things about you that only you know, you know, or somebody that's a stranger that wouldn't know this about you, she probably thought, man, if he knows that, he knows everything. And that's the way conviction works, you know. Usually, God, there's one sin that when you hear a preaching or teaching or you're reading the Bible or however it works, you read a track, there's usually one sin that really nails us, that one thing, whatever it is. And then our minds flood with, man, I'm a sinner all the way through. I thought I had it hid. I thought nobody knew about it. But wow, here it is. And so here's this woman when she takes off. She does what anybody should do in witnessing. She did two things. She told him what she knew about Christ. What did she know about Christ? Well, he told me everything that, I, he told me my whole life. He told me, he knows everything about me. And then she invited them to come and meet Christ. Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? This is the Christ. This is the one that we've heard about. And, he, and the thing is, she dropped her attitude toward the Jews because Jesus was a Jew but now she's inviting people to come to him this woman why would she have this much uh, boldness and this much confidence and sincerity to go into a town where everybody thought bad about her to say hey there's a man out here y'all have to come and meet you have to come and meet him and the, and the thing is people listen to her they're going to go meet him and so I think that evidence I think witnessing is an evidence of the new birth not that we're going to witness, some people just, it's like, it's hard for them to witness to somebody. But it's easier for us to witness to our families, our friends. I know it's hard for some people. I was a pastor for 30, 30 years. It's hard to get people to just confront somebody cold calling, confront somebody on the street, confront somebody in a park. I get that. Not everybody, for some reason or other, my, my take on it, not everybody can do that. But everybody's commanded to be a witness some way or other. And we need to be witnessing for Christ. And if we are saved, we have a desire for that. We have a desire for people to get saved. We want to talk about it. I remember when I first got saved, I, did, I, I tried to tell everybody I could. And then I went through a spell where I got real shy of it. You know, I, you know, I, I, learned, I, I grew up, I learned the Romans Road, and I'd go out. And I mean, I would get so nervous well, I wasn't too nervous around my family and friends, but when it was somebody I didn't know, I, would get so, I just had to make myself keep doing it because I wanted to do it. I wanted to tell people about Christ, and so did this woman. She just, there was no inhibitions with her. She just went for it. And remember the time, you know, when we first got saved. I, pray, I hope you can remember. And you were told people about Christ. And I think our, maybe the church in America is getting away from that. We've grown to where we... We're deep into Bible study, and I'm all about Bible study. I love it. But we're leaving out the things that God called us to do. One of the, the main things is to witness for Christ, is to be a witness. And that just that means that wherever you are. I, a pastor, and I would have visitation when I first would get into a church. We'd have visitation like crazy. Knock on 100, 200 doors a day. Our churches grew. Um, and then I got to where I started teaching them, okay, guys, we're having all this visitation, but we should be doing this naturally. You should be witnessing without me having to say, I want you here Thursday nights at 7 or Saturdays at 1030. You should be doing that anyway. That should be an everyday thing. And as it would catch on. And before you know it, our visitation wasn't that well attended because people were witnessing all the time. It, they were witnessing all the time. That needs to just become our lifetime. That just needs to become a lifestyle for us. It's just wherever we are, we witness. 
We try to bring people to Christ. And it's, it's, it seems like I, I've, I've seen it through my life now. It might be because I started out pastoring in the South and I, I've moved West. You know, I've spent time in Salt Lake City and different places. And Salt Lake City was a hard nut to crack. I mean, it was hard to get those people to come to church. But we did. And there's people saved. Uh, but it seems like it's just getting harder for people to, to accept, to, to, to witness, to, to get saved, to come to church. It doesn't matter. We're still to do that. And if it's in our heart, if we're saved, it is in our heart for people to, be, to get saved. And so now, it says, In the meanwhile, verse 31, His disciples prayed Him, saying, Master, eat. But He saith unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said His disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus, witnessing was Jesus' top priority. He, that, I mean, he, he, he got, I mean, you could say Jesus got excited. Because here he is talking to this Samaritan woman. This Samaritan woman goes off and starts telling everybody in the town about who Jesus is. That's the reason he came. He was excited about that. And he goes, you know what? There's things that's more important to me that gets me fired up more than eating. My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. Jesus said, I'd rather conform to the will of God and do what God wants me to do and complete his work and proclaim the truth to lost sinners and to go and die on the cross for lost sinners than eat. You know, and, and, the, and the idea of that is every one of us, we have something. That really just, we lose ourselves in. Whatever it is, it might be fishing, it might be shopping, I mean, it might be, I mean, it just, you just love it. I love going to the gym. I mean, that's where I can just forget everything and work out hard and run two or three miles and just, I just, I just zone out of everything but that. I, but Jesus is saying, you know what? If you want to say, you know, you enjoy eating, we get hungry. But he says, you know what I lose myself in? Witnessing to the lost. Witnessing to lost people. That's the reason he came. Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Look over a couple pages to John chapter 6 in verse 38. In verse 38 of John chapter 6, it says, For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. We've got to make witnessing a priority. We've got to say, okay, my will is, I just don't want, I can't open my mouth. I, I can't say a word to anybody. But it's the Father's will that we do that. And we've got to figure out ways to do it. And however we can to break the ice, however we can to encourage people to, uh, uh, to tell them, I mean, excuse me, to tell them about Christ. How can we bring that up? Um, I know when, when I was in Salt Lake, it was, I mean, it was so easy to get a conversation started without me just walking up and cold calling somebody. Now, we did knock a lot of doors. We knocked 200 doors a day for the first year and a half. But that wasn't very beneficial. It didn't work for me. Nobody came. I mean, you know, you knock on 1,000 doors a week, and you get up and get in the service the next Sunday, and there's two people there, and they're the ones that have been going the whole time. But eventually, God blessed us in other ways, and people did come. We filled it up. But... Um, my, my southern accent I would be talking to somebody and they'd go where are you from and I'd go man I'm from you know I'd tell them where I was from and I'd go I moved out here and, I, and I, there it was I moved out here to start a church I moved out here to take a church and tell people about Christ and there we went you know and open up all kinds of things and that was, that was easy it was good for me in Salt Lake that was one way to get the, the conversation started I mean so many people would ask me where are you from and it was my southern accent out there in, in, the, in Salt Lake. But Jesus came to do the will of the Father. You've got to figure out whatever it takes to do the will of the Father. And one of the will, the will of God is that we be a witness for Christ. Be a witness wherever you are. Um, verbally. We need to verbalize this. Not just live a good life. We should. That, would glorify, that God, people would see our, our lights would shine and it would glorify the Father. But we've got to be talking it. We've got to be speaking it. 
And I pray right now, while, we're, while I'm talking about this, somebody come into your mind that you can go, hey, I can call them on the phone. I can go over and see them this afternoon. I can tell somebody about Christ this week. Ask God if, if this week somebody, Lord, it's your will that I witness for you. Send me somebody that I can witness for Christ. It was the craziest thing that we were getting that car. Uh, it's a Chick, Chick-fil-A um, symbol on the side of it. We, my son and I, we were at the dealership getting it. And the guy that was selling this car, he was from um, somewhere around Afghanistan. And this was just before the pandemic broke out. And, um, and he was sitting there, and, he, and, and there was rumors of it. You know, this was like in February. This is going to get bad and all this. And we were sitting there waiting on him to do paperwork and stuff. And he goes, man, I'm scared. And he said, you know what? I, I, I'm stuck this far away from my family. I don't know, you know, I'm going to die over here. My dad's old. Is he going to get it over there and die? And he goes, is there a God? I mean, just out of the blue. And I go, let me tell you about that. So while we're buying a car, I'm sitting there, you know, and going through a tract I had, the gospel with this guy. And sure, yeah, we prayed while we were sitting, while he was getting the car. And um, so I left. We, you know, we had to make a t- couple trips back with the car t- and get things done. And every time I talked to him, I go, man, I want you to come to church here. And I go, if you don't want to go out, go somewhere this Sunday, man. Because he was every time he saw me, hey, I got another question for you. I got another question for you. Well, about a month went by. I stopped in to see him. Man, he, he, he'd left the country. Just before they shut down and said, you can't fly places, he'd... The guy said, man, he, that guy just got up one day and quit and flew back to Afghanistan. I'm thinking, could not. Maybe that guy's over there telling everybody over there what happened to him. I'll never see that guy again. If he got saved, I'll see him in heaven. And who knows, he might have been like a Samaritan woman. He might have went over there and just started telling everybody about Christ. I don't know what he did. I like to think those things, though. You know, we like to think those things. But God will open up opportunities, and there's times... He opens up opportunities, and we just keep our mouth shut. Let's open our mouth. Jesus said, I came to do the will of the Father. Let's look at verse 39. I'm still in John chapter 6. And this is the Father's will which he has sent, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up at that last day. Jesus was consumed with this. I mean, this was his priority. He was trying to tell people about Christ, whether it was at a well on a dirt desert road in Samaria called Sychar. He was going to talk about who he was and their great need of everlasting life. And that's got to be our will. And God will open it up. Just ask him. Say, God, give me an opportunity to witness this week. Somebody. Give me somebody. And I, 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 I just about almost guarantee you will. Something will come up with some casual conversation you're having. Who knows? But God, that's God's will. This is the will. And of course, I already told you, you know, uh, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 10, he, Jesus came to seek and to save what, which was lost. I want to look at one other passage in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5. Verse 31, Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus looked at people like a doctor would look at sick people and want them to get better. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus is after sinners. That should be our goal and desire. Man, we're surrounded by them. There's people lost all around us. Our priority ought to be, God, I can't win them all maybe, but send me somebody this week that I can talk to. Jesus made that a priority. He made it such a priority that, you know what, Jesus really didn't get into the political and the landscape of the time. He dealt with religious matters. And I think the devil sometimes sends us distractions, puts distractions up in front of us that we could use as witnessing points. 
But we get so focused on maybe what's going on in America right now. We're so focused on that instead of using it as a witness point because people today, I mean, death was all around us before the pandemic. People, thousands die every day. Car accidents, heart attack, cancer, whatever. I mean, death is, it's, a, it's here. It, it, it's not going anywhere until Jesus comes back and we go to heaven to live forever. Then all of a sudden the pandemic, which focuses us a little more on death, people that had death on their mind. What a time to use that for witnessing. And that, and that was good that we got to use the internet and go over that. You know, a lot of people heard the gospel, but at the same time churches were shut down. We couldn't do our ta the task, couldn't do the things that God told us to do because the government wouldn't let us out, wouldn't let us do anything. Everybody was scared. So I think we ought to say, Lord, we should have a great revival of people being saved during this time. There's people thinking about death like they've never thought about it. Because we have, we're so used to car accidents and cancer and heart attacks. We, we can hear about that stuff and we just go on and never think anything of it. But something new came along. And all of a sudden, death is priority in our thoughts. There's our time for witnessing. That's time for God's will to be accomplished in us through these things. But that was Jesus' priority. Now, Jesus, in all this, he's teaching his disciples, and he gives them some good insight here. Look at verse 35. Um, he says, Say not ye there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields where they are ready for, to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I have sent you to reap whereon you bestowed no labor. Other men labored and you are entered into their labors. So here Christ has given us some insight, which is really some encouragements about witnessing. He's, he, first of all, he tells them about the urgency of it. Now, the things I read, they said that Jesus was probably, as he was sitting there talking to his disciples, the woman had gone from the well into the city. And as the Samaritans were walking to the well, Jesus would look and, he, and with the background and the clothes that they were wearing, they would look like it was harvest time. The, the, their bodies, it would be like a wheat harvest and they looked like, and he would look at them and go, the fields are wide unto harvest. Don't wait. So he encourages us with urgency. And that urgency isn't a like, go do it. You got to do it, man. Come on, let's go. The urgency is, it's what? It's ready. <laughs> let's not wait on it. Let's get the gospel out every opportunity we can. Let's not wait until, well, let's wait till after this, or let's wait till this. Let's see what happens over here. Let's see what. No, the urgency is already what unto harvest. As Jesus looked at those Samaritans coming to him, he knew whose heart was prepared and whose wasn't to receive the truth of who he was. We don't know that. We don't have that kind of insight into men's heart that Christ had. And so we just go to everybody. But if we go, he says, there's a harvest. There's a harvest. There's people there prepared. Their hearts are prepared to receive the truth that you're about to give them. And that doesn't matter where you are. What part? I mean, I, I mean, I remember in Salt Lake, I used to look at that verse and I go, God, I don't know. Are there anybody here? You know, because we witnessed. I mean, we went for it. And it somewhere along the way, God started building his church. But, man, we had to go through a lot of witnessing and a lot of rejection and a lot of. And who knows what happened after we left those homes? You know? They might have been a Nicodemus and got on their knees and, and received Christ and just was, wouldn't come out of it. But Jesus is saying there's urgency to this. They're ready. That's, that's encouraging to me. That's exciting to me. Don't wait, he says. Behold, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields that's white, all ready to harvest. The gospel still has its power. It hasn't lost its power. Now, we might doctor it up to where we hide the cross of Christ. People try to get so fancy with it today that we hide it. The cross of Christ is of none effect, as Paul would say. 
why don't we just give out the word, man? You're a sinner. You need to get saved. And, you know, go through it. You know, now it's all this. I hear some, I hear some presentations sometimes and I go, I guess, I, you know, I guess that works. I don't know, but it's a lot simpler to just go and go, hey, man, you know, all the sin that comes short of the glory of God. And let the Holy Spirit begin to do that work. And, but they always, you know, you know how people are. As we get on up into go forward, we all think we're smarter than God and try to figure it out and try to do this, that, and the other. Instead, we just go out and give the simple message. Jesus said it's white unto harvest. Go get it. That's encouraging me. Go get it. Go get it. Verse 36, and he says, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. F gathering fruit unto eternal life. I like that. That both the sower and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And here isn't that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. Not only does Jesus show them the urgency in this, but he shows them that all need to participate in this. One sows and another reaps. Everybody needs to be involved in that. A lot of times the one who sows gets real discouraged because they don't see any fruit real quick. <clears throat> and all of a sudden somebody comes along and reaps. And we might get discouraged at their reaping. But they're, everything we do, guys, we reap is because somebody sowed before us. I don't care to be that person that sows before somebody else. Now, I used to be. I used to, I used to want it to be the... Yeah, everybody wants to be the reaper, but I wanted to be it so bad that it discouraged me in my obedience of witnessing to Christ the way I should. It almost got me to the point of saying, it just, it just does no good. I mean, I got to the point in Salt Lake where I go, God is just, nobody's going to come to church here. <laughs> and I realized, hey, I'm the sower. I'm going to sow. And we just kept sowing. Keep sowing. We're sowing here. And he says, somebody's going to reap. We might reap. But if we don't, we had a great part in the sowing. A great part in the sowing. We can read missionary stories. Adoniram Judson, Hudson Taylor, these guys that were pioneers into these countries and went through all kinds of hardships. We're reaping now because of things that they did before us. And then there's other places that missionaries need to go that they need to blaze the trail and will sow and they might not reap in their lifetime but a new generation comes along that's the importance of us keep on pushing this so other people will rise up and go i'm going here and i'm going there and people's already sown it's wide unto harvest but even if it's not it there'd be a harvest of some sort but don't say uh, i'm just i'm not reaping anything we're sowing that's participating and what God called us to do. It's up to him who gets saved. Just give out the word. We've, I'm praying we hand out these Bibles and give them out. And I'm praying, God, I don't know once we give a Bible to somebody, what the, I just pray you'll save souls unbelievable. That only in heaven you'll see the benefits of all this. I'm just going to sow. I might not see results other than people's calling and asking me for Bibles. You know, everybody wants free Bibles. I, I get that. And I want to do as much as I can to get them back. But we might not, I might not personally see any fruit from that in this lifetime. But I'm participating. As Jesus called these guys, participate in this. You sow. Somebody's going to reap. You might reap. You might see some of the rewards of it. But we'll never fully realize all the benefit, all the... God, I pray, I think he'll show us when we get to heaven, this is what happened. And we'll be in heaven going, pray. it was all Jesus, you know, because I thought I was, I got discouraged for sowing and not reaping, and then I got prideful when I reaped, when I didn't sow. But it was all one big group. It was a team effort in the kingdom of God to win people to Christ and to tell people about Jesus Christ. These are encouraging things to me. Because there's prepared hearts out there. He says, you go, you sow, you start the preparation. Another reaps. You might reap, he said in verse 36, and he that reapeth receiveth wage. Somebody reaps. But somebody sows. And sometimes we think we want to be on the reaping end. I do. 
If I, if I was to lean toward one way, I would heavily lean that way. But if I'm part of the sowing, I'm okay with that too. Because I'm doing as much of the will of God as somebody that's reaping like we, like phenomenally. And so it's not them. That's the way God works. And we're just instruments in his kingdom to participate in what he's given us to do and to do his will. And if we do that, we'll get to heaven. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's all I can be. The reaping is up to him. The sowing is up to me. It's, you know, as Paul said, God is the one who gives the increase. One waters. One, I mean, one sows, one waters, but God gives the increase. So let's not grow weary in well-doing. Let's not get discouraged and say, man, we live in a difficult time. Hey, we're sowing something for the kingdom of God that we don't know what the outcome will be, but I'm going to be excited about this, and I'm going to be encouraged that God's doing something, and somewhere, somehow, whatever He wants reaped will be reaped. And I had a part in it. I had a part. Because I might not saw anything, but I've reaped. And we all can be that way. I'm shooting my sowed. We can all be that way. We can all do that. And so this was insights that he had to encourage these people that, hey, there's people out there that's spiritually ready. Start sowing. Start sowing. You reap some. You go someplace else. Reap there. But always remember this. We'll never reap. Excuse me, the only reason, the only way we can reap is because somebody sowed before us. Somebody sowed before us. And so that's, that's what Jesus is encouraging them with. And so he's trying to make them part and see, hey, let's not get prideful. When they got to Corinth, they did, didn't they? I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? No, we're all one in this. So it's not some little church stuck over here in a corner of Las Vegas somewhere. Every time we witness, every time we preach, every time we do we're being we're participating in the kingdom of God and His will for what He wants His children to do. And we'll leave everything else up to Him and be encouraged by it. Or I am at least. And so here was things that Jesus gave them, some insights to encourage them. So let's never hang our heads and go, it can't be done. It can be done. Verse 39. You go back to the Samaritans. We took a little sidetrack there for a minute to see Jesus was teaching his disciples as he was waiting on the Samaritan people to come. And look at verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him. One woman's witness Many believed. For the saying of the woman which testified told me all things that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. They wanted him to hang around. We want to know this guy. We want to know more about him. And then look at that last verse 41. And many more believed because of his own word. And, the say, and, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Look at how Christ's, Christ's impact on human hearts. Because of that girl's witness, many in his town goes, He's the Savior of the world. I mean, to, to a Samaritan, that meant a lot. Remember? They were enemies. They, they were at each other's throats. They didn't like each other. And for them to look at Jesus, a Jew, and go, the Messiah or Christ, the Savior of the world. To the Jew, that was a smack in the face. They didn't want anything to do with the Samaritans. To the Samaritans, that was a sign of great humility. But more than that, it was a sign of salvation. They would have never have said that if they hadn't have said, if they hadn't have been saved themselves. And when the Bible says that many more believed, and when they believed, they said, He is the Savior of the world. God, when we listen, guys, when we witness and we present Christ to people, He has an impact on human hearts. He can change their thinking, He can change their heart, He can change the way they are. 
He can take bad people and turn them into good people. Christ impacts the world. And we might be sitting over in a corner, you know, going, well, this seems like everything's getting worse. I can't look at that. I can't look. I got to look in the Word of God and go, I've got news about the Savior of the world that will save your soul and save your soul from hell. So you don't have to spend an eternity in hell. I don't care what political persuasion you're of. I don't care which side of the line you fall on. Jesus is Savior of the world. Jesus came and they believed. When we present Christ enough, somebody will get saved. Then that person, if they truly get saved, they become a witness for Christ. Now, I've seen this in my ministry. They get saved. Next thing you know, they bring in four or five. One of those gets saved. They bring in, and your church, and it starts producing like that. Dr. Robertson, who was a pastor of Highland Park Baptist Church, president of Tennessee Temple University, started it. He used to say, I heard him say it several times, guys, the gospel hadn't lost its power. We're just not giving it out. It's the only reason people aren't getting saved. The gospel hasn't lost its power. We've just quit giving it out. And we get so caught up into our, what our little world, we get choked and smothered by the cares of this life. And it becomes all about us that we forget to think about anybody else. No, if somebody put, a, if somebody pointed, if somebody pressured us, yeah, I, w- I would love to see people get saved. And if they, if they followed that up with, well, I, when was the last time you witnessed to somebody? And I don't know. What about your family? What about your friends? Guys, we got to get back to this. Jesus is a savior of the world as a priority in our life. And we need to be praying, God, give me somebody to witness to this week. Then give me the boldness to open my mouth for Christ. For whatever reason, we can talk about everything else. And we get, start talking about Christ, we get tongue-tied. Get scared, whatever, whatever it is. And I get it. I, I, I've been there, done that, you know. But I ask God to give me the boldness to say, okay, I'm going to talk to you about that. If we present Christ to the world, we might not have been in the mess we've been right now. Might not be. If we'd have made Christ priority and Christ witness a priority, maybe the things you hear about in missions and the things you hear about in Christian schools wouldn't be that way right now. I don't know. I just, it might not be. But I do know this, if we are to do the will of the Father, if we're to do what He wants us to do, then we'll be sharing Christ with people and telling them He's the Savior of the world. People don't like it. People get mad at you. go, hey, man, I just wanted to tell that to you. I'm not mad. I mean, (laughs) you see, when I was younger, I would sit there and get mad back back at them. But I got to where, you know what? I just wanted to tell you that. Have a good day. And I just go on. No fighting, no arguing. I did what I was supposed to do. Here's the gospel. You get mad. You say, I don't believe in God. I'm not arguing, sir. I just want to tell you this. And you get to say, thank you for your time and go on. And not get discouraged because you might be sowing that that person you just witnessed to might not be saved for another 20 years. But you were the one that sowed the first seed. You never know in the kingdom of God what God is doing. And so let's just do what he tells us to do every day. And as we do that, then there's going to be some reaping. There's going to be souls saved. There's going to be disciples made. But we have to continue to do our part. We can't get discouraged. We can't throw in the towel. We can't say it's too late. Because I don't know what too late is. We're just supposed to, God didn't tell us anything about time frames other than, hey, it's urgent. Don't wait four months. Do it now. Let's be about the Father's business. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for teaching us and encouraging us in this area of witnessing. Lord, there's souls all around us lost, dying, going to hell. And Jesus is the Savior of the world. And Lord, you know the hearts that are prepared 
to hear it, to receive it. And Lord, we ask you to just send them our way. Help us to tell them about Christ. Give us the boldness to do these things. And Lord, if nothing else, we're part of the sowing and reaping process. We're just as valuable as the ones who reap, as the ones who sow. And so, Father, just bless and encourage us in this matter. Because Jesus is the Savior of the world. In Jesus' name, amen.